short notice, but it's exciting. Okay. Talent show auditions uh, are happening now in room two five. Announcements. If you want to participate in the talent show auditions are happening now in room two two five. Are you guys ready to start? Yeah, we're, we're ready. Uh, we'll have two more people join us, but they're going to be in, in to join when we get back to rebuttal parts because okay. we're in the middle of our finals. We have our semesters end a little bit earlier, so oh, okay. uh, it's a little bit crazy for us today. Do you guys want to start with your intro or should we? Go ahead. You can start. Okay. Good afternoon, Texas. It's great to be contacting again today. As if you are, don't remember, my name is Melanie. I'm an executive member of David Suzuki's debate team. Today, we are all looking forward to this impromptu debate about whether Donald Trump should be impeached or not. Just a quick summary of how things should go today. We'll begin with the two minute speeches and the two main topics beginning with economic, three, sorry, three main topics beginning with economics, pro followed by con, and again, for the ethical and overall performance. Right after the speeches are done, we will continue on to the rebuttal period. The rebuttal period will last approximately 25 to 30 minutes. I'll give a five minute warning so that everyone has time to fit in one to two more points and then we'll end with our conclusions. So if you guys will either pass on to your introduction or we can begin with pro impeachment economics. Do you have an intro or should we just move on to the speeches? No, go ahead with your speech. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. All right. So I'm going to talk about the American economics and what Trump's done. So with Trump as president, a trade war with China has been occurring. And as you know, this has caused many problems for the U.S. economy. In the United States alone, the trade war has brought struggles for farmers and manufacturers specifically and higher prices for consumers all over the United States. A study conducted by the Rhodium Group uh, shows that the economic impact of the trade war and it also estimates that the effect of a tariff increases to 25% on the US to on new on $200 billion of US Chinese products. And they're currently hit with a 10% duty by the US government. This find it finds that the tariffs significantly reduce US GDP, employment and investment, and export and import prices will rise, which means the US products will be less competitive overseas, which hurts their economy overall, and consumers will be having will be having to spend more money uh, for products. Over a decade, uh, over the next decade, the cumulative impact would leave the GDP with a total of one trillion dollars lower than it would have been without tariffs. Uh, the research found, and this is all due to Donald Trump and his and his trade war with China. Uh, overall, the study is also saying that uh, the information communication technology sector has been heavily hurted and exposed by the trade war, because within five years of the tariffs introductions, the exports of ICT goods which includes anything from microchips to laptops to semiconductors could be 20% lower than they were under before the trade war, uh, trade war with China. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vanessa, um, introduce yourself. So, um, I'm Vanessa. I'm also going to be speaking about the economics since Donald Trump has become president. Should I, are you guys ready? Yeah, go. Um, the business of America is America's business, said President Calvin Coolidge. However, it could have been said by President Trump. Today, America's business has never been so good. Since President Donald Trump took office, the economy added 6 million jobs and the unemployment rate dropped to the lowest level in nearly 50 years. The economic growth rate is 2%. Median household income rose 2.3% and average weekly paychecks rose 2.8%. The poverty rate and food stamp rolls declined. Stock prices rose, the S&P 500 index was up 29.8%, and single family home prices rose nearly 23%. The number of murders dropped 6.9%. Trump has filled 43 seats on federal appeals courts compared to 25 filled by Obama. The, the DOW the Dow Jones stood average the stock average gained almost 60% of its present value and it stood at $18,832 on November 8th. In his first year as president, the stock market made 71 new highs and our GDP set a new record in 2018. Facts could not do justice to how America is doing economically today. We are currently the number one producer of energy in the world. 
40 years ago, Jimmy Carter went before the American people in a sweater and in front of a fireplace to tell his fellow citizens that we needed to suffer because we cannot produce energy like we used to. Now America has a great deal of energy, so much so that we are exporting energy to other countries. This didn't happen by accident, didn't happen by chance. This happened because of Donald Trump's presidency. Going back to our Christian roots, I would like to reference a biblical story. When Moses went to Mount Sinai for 40 days to speak with God, his people disobeyed him and fought with each other and pointed fingers. This can compare to today, Trump isn't Moses, but are we not the same people who rebelled against Moses? Are we not the same people that put our wants for the nation's needs? Are we not the same people who, when faced with a problem, try to place blame and get rid of a person instead of doing what is best for the country? I started this talk talking about our economy. I'd like to end it by asking this question. Is getting rid of a sitting president that has been highly successful months before an election worth the cost of what it would do to the future of the office? Who would want to be a leader of the free world when the price is too high? In the 1950s, America faced communism and defeated it. Now America needs to look in the mirror and face our new enemy, ourselves. All right, thank you. We'll now be moving on to the ethics speech. Okay, so uh, we recently learned about the, it's kind of personal. We recently learned about uh, president. That's how the Roman government worked. It's basically setting up precedent. And we feel like the precedent that was set with the situation around Trump and the whole Ukraine thing is kind of a bit off. So let me just begin by saying, before Trump even initiated his campaign, he had already engaged in very unethical issues. President Trump is accused of pressuring Ukraine to dig up damaging information on one of his main democratic, democratic challenges for the upcoming primaries in 2020, Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden. Hunter worked for a Ukrainian company with, when Joe Biden was the US vice president, which opens up a little bit of questions of ethics, but we're focusing on Trump right now. The president is accused of dangling two things as bargaining chips for Ukra uh, Ukraine, which is, which is usually referred to in the media as a quid pro quo. And he first one was withholding 400 million and military aid to Ukraine. Ukraine is under Russia right now, so the, U the military aid and the money would have really benefited them. And that is how we ethically, we want to say that Trump is just, my bad, I'm, I'm reading a bit off script. Pardon? It's, it's not basically a conflict, conflict of interest, but this would amount to an abuse of presidential power, using the office for personal or political gain, because he has given Hunter Biden and Joe Biden basically uh, a, a referendum. So basically either Ukraine gives us th this and that, or we withhold this and that. And this, we feel like it's unethical for a president to ever attempt something like this. Oh, thank you. Now you can move on to your point. I'm Emma Castro and I'll be representing the ethical argument on this debate. So months before this inquiry began, some Democrats tried to avoid the president as he entered the House chamber in February to deliver his State of the Union speech, but not Van Drew, who made it a point to shake Mr. Trump's hand. Van Drew, a former dentist from Cape May, says he dislikes the president's rudeness at times, but agrees with some of the positions and doesn't openly shun the president and some of his colleagues have. My job isn't to really like or dislike him, he said in an interview with USA Today in his office on Capitol Hill. My job is to exact as much goodwill and help from my district and for this nation and for this world that I possibly can while he is the president. Now, after days of testimony detailing Trump's dealings with Ukraine, House Democrats leaders have would have a vote, would, excuse me, would hold a vote of articles of impeachment by the end of the year. In these articles, if they are approved, they would send the matter to the Senate for the trial of whether Trump should have should be removed from office. But Van Drew remains opposed to the impeachment, saying it would fracture the nation. The stance has won praise from the president who has tweeted out his words, and while he considers the president's actions on Ukraine unsavory, the congressman has said has yet to learn of anything that would persuade him that Trump has done something to warrant removal from office. Now, a timeline is the diagram of events of the impeachment inquiry of President Trump. I must point out that no president has ever been removed from office, Van Drew, Van Drew points out. And to have a small elite group of lawmakers do so when an election is less than a year away seems to be not only unfathomable, but un-American. To some folks, it is reminiscent of what 
because done to kings and queens many years ago, he said, everything our country does not stand for. Second, there is no bipartisan support for impeachment. Democratic leaders were hopeful as at least few Republicans would back impeachment, and after nearly two weeks of public hearings laying out Trump's efforts to dig up the dirt on Biden and play up a widely described theory that Ukraine meddled in the 2016 election on, the behalf, on behalf of Hillary Clinton, but then drew skepticism er, indicates that even getting full Democrat support in the House for articles of impeachment will be difficult. Potential GOP, de, excuse me, GOP de factors such as Representative Francis Rooney of Florida and Representative Will Hurd of Texas have shown no in inclination to support impeachment. Poll number of Americans supporting Trump's impeachment and removal unchanged by the hearings. Hurd, who sits in the Intelligence Committee presiding over the inquiry, said during a hearing on November 21st that he believed the administration's efforts to pressure Ukraine undetermined undermine national security. He also said that he believed an impeachable offense should be compelling, overwhelmingly clear, and unambiguous. It is not something to be rushed over or taken lightly. I have not heard evidence proving this president committed bribery or extortion. If the House provides articles of impeachment, the GOP-led Senate is expected to hold trial in January. The Senate Majority Leader, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says that he can't imagine a scenario where 67 senators, the minimum required for requirements to remove a president would, ba would back such a step. Doing so would require at least 20 Republicans to break from the party. So this would not be ethical because no one, there is no bipartisan support. There's not even one party that fully supports this. So how can it be ethical, especially when you have the fact that it is, there's no evidence to back up this theory and no evidence means there's no case. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So now we'll be moving on to our speech on his overall performance. So on January 20th, 2017, Donald Trump was sworn into office and made president. But as time has gone on, there have been mixed emotions about how exactly he's performing himself, uh, I mean, performing as a president. And you know, that has to do a lot with the controversial things he's done, his, a lot of his misconduct, and you know, the incompatible acts that he's committed as president. Now, to start, Donald Trump has committed numerous impeachable offenses, including but not limited to the obstruction of justice, contempt of the Congress, and tampering of elections. Okay, so firstly, Trump has, okay, Trump has uh, obstructed justice in a plethora of ways, but one particular way was by having the White House cover up information about his controversial phone call with Ukraine. Now, this has been touched on before, but the fact of the matter is, that he had the White House misclassify the information so that it couldn't be dug into. And this, the phone call itself, like the, the contents of it, were in regards to the upcoming election and dirt he was trying to find on his uh, competitor, Joe Biden. Another way that he is obstructed justice was by, well, his own admittance to firing the director of the FBI in order to prevent the discovery of his nefarious actions that he conducted during his campaign. Now, next, Trump has also held the Congress in contempt by outright denying to participate in, the, in his impeachment investigations. Now, that's something far worse than President Nixon in the past has also done, and he also faced impeachment for the same thing. And lastly, Trump has spent more than $280,000 of unaccounted for money during the end of his potential campaign, or his presidential campaign, I'm sorry. Money of this magnitude around the end of one's campaign is almost assuredly money to silence individuals who've been willing to speak out against him. Now, since the 2016 election was so close, this money almost, almost certainly had affected the results. So Trump's overall performance is poor. Outside of the financial and ethical arguments for his impeachment, he's also considered con committed numerous impeachable offenses that more than warrant his impeachment. Thank you. I'll begin now in saying that the 19th century English author began his tale of two cities with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. We had everything before us and we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct to the other way. 
In short, he was describing France, but could have easily have been describing the political climate of the United States today. In Thomas Paine's Common Sense, there's a line that reads, there are times where we try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in crisis shrink from the service of the country and that he stands in now deserves the love and thinks of men and women. We bring this question and quotation into this debate if only for the expectation that while one may not agree with some, if any, of the current president's policies, there's an expectation to uphold the constitution to those in power and that those in power do not shrink away from the service of their country. We live in troubled times, no doubt, so we are here today to stand up to defend the concept that impeachment and the subsequent trial of the President of the United States. President Trump is in the process of being impeached due to high crimes and misdemeanors that are impeachable due to the following article. Articles 1 of the abuse of power reads that the Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall be have the sole power of impeachment and that the President shall be removed from office of impeachment for and convicted of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanor. misdemeanors. In his conduct of the office of President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of the President of the United States and to the best of his ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and in violation of his own constitutionality to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. They contend that President Trump acted both directly and through his agents within the outside of the United States government and corruptly solicited the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations into a political opponent, former Vice President Joe Biden. Now, however, on January 23rd, 2019, just a year after leaving the White House, Vice President Joe Biden was sitting on the stage of the Council of Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. to present an article called How to Stand Up to Kremlin. He had been answering questions for almost an hour when the moderator turned to the war in Ukraine and the prospects for peace. Among the things standing in the way, Biden said, was growing corruption. And then he told a story. Recounting a trip to Kiev in the late 2015, Biden described telling the then president of the Ukraine that he had to fire the prosecutor general in the U.S. or he would not release the $100 billion in loan guarantees. I looked at them and said, I'm leaving in six hours, Biden told the crowd, but taking a long look at his watch for effects. So if the prosecutor is not fired, you are not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch. Here the audience laughed. He got fired. Where was this public outcry? Where was the moral obligation? Have you a you have a former vice president of the United States admitting to blackmail and extortion to help his family. He was able to help his own son not face a trial. This is criminal. Yet in Washington, they try to impeach President Trump over trying to find out information about the 2015 blackmail committed by Vice President Biden by Vice President Biden's own admittance. So this, is no, this notion has no logic. You cannot impeach President Trump on the hearsay evidence for a crime that Vice President Joe Biden committed earlier. If this case against Trump ends up in the conviction over trying to find out what crimes are committed by Vice President Biden, and if Biden is the Democratic nominee that wins the 2020 election, maybe we should be calling for his impeachment right here and right now. Additionally, the Democrats in this are saying that this is all an effort to make sure that Trump is not reelected. But by attempting to impeach the president on the terms that have been laid out today, they have hurt their chances in the 2020 election. According to James Fetzer, a professor, a professor at the University of Minnesota, the House of Dems impeachment will not only fail to remove Trump from office, but is likely to backfire in the Democratic Party during the 2020 election. As things stand, it looks like Democrats will go down hard in 2020. The professor suggests that the impeachment inquiry launched by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Andrew Schiff, in late September 2019 was driven by fear, by the fear of the Dems. Overall, to hold the president to different standards than the previous vice president is not ethical and it cannot hold in the impeachment inquiry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now be moving on to our rebuttal period. Would you like to begin? Go ahead and begin and it will. Oh. Okay, we'll begin. Um, so just to kind of go back on what you guys um, said earlier about kind of how Trump shouldn't um, be held liable. Essentially, in accordance to rule of law, um, nobody is above the law, including the president. And even though somebody else, um, somebody else was convicted for it then, and therefore it doesn't mean that um, Trump should be convicted. One Sorry, can we just have one second? Thank you.
Though Joe Biden has been accused, and yes, he did admit he did something, regardless, due to rule of law, Donald Trump did commit an act and has a, well, accused of an act. And based on that, even though nobody, due to the fact that nobody's above the law, just because one person got excused for it does not mean that Donald Trump should. If he has already been, if he's already been accused of this, then the impeachment process, process should continue to see whether he was really guilty of this. And then we can determine um, everyone's cases are not the same. Do, Joe Biden's matter may have been different from Donald Trump's and we cannot compare the two acts. And also um, this whole debate wasn't, we're not talking about the discussion of whether Joe Biden was fit to be vice president. We're discussing whether Trump should be impeached. So for now we should be focusing on his acts what, regardless of comparing them to others of past presidents or vice presidents. In addition, this offense isn't you know, a, a singular um, occurrence. He has many other impeachable offenses just to add to this list. So one, you know, excusing him from one extra doesn't stop him from, doesn't, you know, degrade his case for impeachment at all. Um, and just also gonna move on a little bit. Earlier on, you spoke about the unemployment rate and you said that currently the unemployment rate is at a like almost all time low, but even though then that's a source of pride for Trump, many economists have pointed out that the rate has been falling steadily since 2011, which is considered the, the Obama era, which means it began then and has been steadily decreasing. So it's difficult to see whether Trump has truly made an impact or has just been continuing the effects of what Obama has done. Because when you, according to the Washington Post, there has been um, studies that have been done by many multiple economists, and you can see that there has been a spike, a spike decreasing Sorry, not a spike up. Oh my gosh. There has been a large decrease of when Obama really began into office. And you can see that there's been so many jobs that have been created. While Trump has only been in office for a bit, whereas Obama served two terms. And during his two terms, he really did decline, make the unemployment rate decline. Is there something you guys want to say? You can okay, go first. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now I'll begin. Um, so to clarify, we bring up Joe Biden's action only in comparison to Trump's actions. Trump's on trial for impeachment due to abuse of power as per the articles of impeachment used in his inquiry. So the abuse of power they bring up consistently in the trial is the Ukraine scandal. So it is not a holistic review of his entire administration. It is that offense and that offense compared to Joe Biden's offense is what we're, that was what our point was. And the fact that if Joe Biden withheld money to save his son from trial to get the main person against his son over there fired, withholding guaranteed loans, from the Ukraine aid loans that will help them. That is not different from what Trump is accused of. Trump being accused on hearsay, for one, and Trump being accused of withholding loans that are not guaranteed to the Ukraine. Furthermore, the, the, you bring up the point that in, econo in, econo in the economy that the unemployment rate has been dropping since Obama, but that is a combined effort of Obama and Trump perhaps, but that does not also account for the stock market going up 60% since the Trump administration started. And that is all. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so on the oh. You want to pull so. it over? So on the matter of the offense between Joe Biden and Trump, Trump did this while he was in office and it sets a bad precedent, uh, precedent because then the uh, United, uh, United States military looks sort of like a militia. You do this for me, I send you military aid, which was what put Ukraine in a tough spot because they uh, need that aid and they need that money. So saying that, oh, Trump, uh, Joe Biden withheld this so that they could get his son out of going to court is just a false equivalence. You are comparing apples to oranges at this point, and it doesn't.
work so well. My bad. If I may elaborate on the point that Joe Biden was himself the one who set the president precedent of the U.S. being a militia and that he was the sitting vice president when he withheld one million dollars of okay. guarantee, I'm sorry, one billion dollars of guaranteed loans to the Ukraine to get his son out of jail and off of trial there, whereas Trump's accusation relies completely on hearsay. There's no actual proof of this and the fact that those loans, the supposed funds that were guaranteed to you, that those supposed funds for the Ukraine were not guaranteed loans. So they were not approved yet. And thus it is not even the same testament of what Joe Biden did yet Joe Biden. So you cannot say that Trump set the precedent when Joe Biden has admitted to this on stage and that the audience laughed. As Joe Biden said this in 2015 and we are now in 2019. <laughs> So to, to believe that uh, Joe Biden has set some sort of precedent to be above the law is incorrect. It's, it's not incorrect, but it's, it defies what the Constitution, not the Constitution, but it, defi it defies the laws that have been set in place in the first place, right? So a president must always uphold the law, right? And no one, not even himself, can be above that. So just because, you know, it's been allowed one time, isn't any reason for it to happen again. Plus, Donald Trump is in office now. Joe Biden was simply the vice president at the time. And to continue. Sorry, just to continue. It should also be considered that, especially since he's president, he has a greater role in the face. He, he's literally the face of America. And so the things he does is more impactful and it's going to have a bigger influence on the world because he's supposed to be the one kind of representing america as a whole whereas joe biden's um kind of role was a little bit lesser in comparison so trump doing it in a sense is worse because he has a certain set of responsibilities and knows he has to do certain things in order to fulfill his role as president he's already aware of this and by being enacted as president he had to know these procedures and these various things and he clearly went against those things despite it even though he wanted to be the role of president. Just to clarify our point, we're not saying that the precedent is right or anything. We're just saying that your point that you pointed out was that, Ms. that President Trump was setting a precedent when this precedent was not set by Mr. Trump. It was set by Joe Biden. And because Mr. Trump's excuse me, President Trump's allegations are based completely on hearsay, whereas Joe Biden's is on admittance of the fact on stage in 2019, I'm sorry, 2018, of his actions in 2015, then it, it does not hold the same accountability. And yes, while Mr. Trump is the face of America right now as the president, Joe Biden was, so, was just as much representing in Ukraine at that time. Yeah. The phone call. The, the phone. Further, the phone call made where the allegations stem from, from Trump to the Ukraine, is literally Trump trying to find information about this blackmail scheme from 2015. There's no there's no proof that there was any allegations. There's no proof of the allegations that he made threats. There was no threats recorded. So how, so how can you say that there was threats and that this is testament on hearsay evidence, legally speaking? But it's only hearsay because he falsely classified the phone call in the first place, which is once again, another form of obstruction of justice. He did it because he knew he was hiding something. But can you speak to the intent of that? If, was it a purpose, this misfile you speak of, what it, where's your source for that?
Can you repeat that? What, what's my source for, for what? For the misfiling of the misclassification. Uh, a CBC article had talked about it. Give me one moment to pull it up for you, though. Hi, hi, sorry. Sorry it took so long. Uh, it's because I wasn't, I was looking for the wrong, the wrong site. I said CBC, my apologies. It was actually a New York Times article uh, that was posted not, not too long ago, actually, December 8th, 2019. And it's called The Eight Counts of Impeachment That Trump Deserves. And in it, it clearly talks about his uh, obstruction of justice and how he had the White House, uh, this is verbatim, most recently, the White House tried to hide evidence about Trump's phone call with Ukraine's president by improperly classifying material about it. And because it was improperly classified, uh, no, like legally, they, were, they weren't able to do an investigation into that matter, which is why they asked him to release a transcript in the first place. And the reason it was this whole issue and it was misclassified in the first place is because it contained matters of, an, of the obstruction of justice. Excuse me, was in these articles of impeachment, was President Trump charged with obstruction of justice? There was no charge of obstruction of justice. It was plain and simple abuse of power and the abuse of power was the Ukrainian deal. So again, there are no eight counts that Mr. Crump, Mr. To be impeached President anyway. Trump but, is being accounted for. But there's, there's no official charge for the obstruction of justice because he's holding the Congress in contempt. He's not, he's denying to participate in uh, any legal investigation into the matter, congressional investigation into the matter, which is just what, uh, which is just like what Nixon did when he was president. And those were also grounds for, for a similar impeachment. Um, do you, are you aware of the number of how many of articles of impeachment the Democrats wrote? No, I am not. It's two articles of impeachment. The first is abuse of power and the second is contempt of Congress. Contempt of Congress. Now the, as we've discussed the first abuse of power, the contempt of Congress one is I think the one you're discussing here in that I must point out he did release the transcripts at a later date, yes, but he did release the transcripts. So this misclassification argument would not hold water as the evidence is there. So Mr. Trump, excuse me, President Trump not participating in it is a false allegation. I'm sorry, can you give me the source for the release of the transcripts? Yeah. One second. Sorry. 
So here it is. It's on the Washington Post, the official readout, President Trump's July 25th phone call with Ukraine's Volodymyr Zelensky. It shows the transcript in that the telephone conversation with President of the Ukraine and the President of Ukraine in the White House Situation Room being the note takers. So this release of the transcript is proof that Mr. Tr that the date. I'm sorry. Tell me the date. The date is the date of the phone call was July 25th, 2019, and it was released on September 20th. It was yeah, it was released September 25th, 2019. I'm sorry, it was declassified by order of the president on September 24th, Um, so either way, um, Mr. Trump appears to tie the U.S. military assistance to Ukraine, launching investigations, which would help him, um, which would help him politically, which led to his um, abuse of power, obstruction of justice, and contempt of Congress. Um, basically, um, Mr. Trump's interactions with Ukraine show him corruptly using the power of the presidency for personal political gain, and it basically shows that he was able to buy almost. Uh, basically, when Trump did the give and take with Ukraine, he basically tried to find out as much as he could about, even though he was trying to find what happened with Joe Biden and everything, he was tying things that weren't just up to him. He tied the whole U.S. military, and he tried to see if that, he tried to tie the U.S. military with deals with Ukraine so that they could help him really gain the power. And especially since this happened near the end of his election and everything like that, it really impacted the results of just voting and everything and whether he silenced any voices that would have spoken out against Donald Trump. Well, you see the idea that his investigation into Biden would hurt Biden's 2020 election is something across from a separate from here because in this there is no direct evidence there is no clear statements that he makes that says i am withholding funds unless you investigate in this he just asks about it he there's no mention of military power unless it is in relation with biden's actions further you say that it would affect the election in 2020 however as i've pointed out earlier there is Plethoras of evidence that say that the election in 2020 is going to be a sure thing, a sure loss in the Democrats section. As things stand, it looks like the Democrats will go down hard in 2020. It was, and this suggests that the impeachment query, inquiries by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Chair of House Intelligence Committee Adam Schiff in late September 2019 is going to actually hurt the Democrats in the 2020 election. So there would be no substantial claim in that. Sorry to interrupt, but some of our students have um, other extracurriculars that they have to attend to in like the next 15 or so minutes. So I'm just gonna give a five minute warning so everyone can get to where they have to go. Um, so you have any concluding points or points that you wanna throw in right now? Please. It's more about the fairness of the impeachment in that, yes, we, why we may not agree with what Trump has been doing or what he's done, it must be pointed out that if you hold an impeachment inquiry, it must meet the standards of the inquiry. And in this case, it is not. And this is a standard of eth ethicalness of the fact that if Joe Biden did this, then and he set a precedent then, then there is no precedent that Trump can set. Further, the economically review, the economic review of Trump's administration says that he has been helping the economy in a way, and while it's not perfect, 
and it's not entirely his, his actions have benefited the economy in some ways. Further, if it won't, you can't hold him against allegations that even the Democrats aren't holding him for. They only hold him against one, the abuse of power and the articles of impeachment, and you have no evidence for the abuse of power, so you cannot impeach him. That's, that's, thank you. Yeah. All right, so just to conclude, though some may argue that Trump has had a lot of economic success, it does not, it does not go, it does not- um, He cannot be credited with he it. He cannot be credited with it due to all the things that he, the acts he, he has committed. And they do not outweigh the things that he's committed, such as the Ukraine, such as the Ukraine phone call, and just the large amount of money that he spent that could not be accounted for near the end of his election. And not only this, but there are many more impeachable offenses. And Trump himself is also just a very controversial individual. Individual, individual. And he has had offenses before. So whether he stands fit to be president or not is up to whether this whole impeachment process goes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're really sorry about how this debate went. We weren't really sure about everything that American governments go, such as the Constitution itself. Um, we really did attempt. We're sorry if it didn't go as well as we thought it would. It did really well. Yeah, it, it's a. Uh, um, it, it's very interesting to note from a, especially a, <clears throat> an international point that uh, many people may not like Trump, but again, it has to be according to the to the law type of stuff. And, and that's what we tried to defend it on because uh, there, there are other people that is very egregious. This uh, deal with Biden in 2015 and his speech in 20, uh, January 23rd of 2018 is uh, pretty scary in the respect that uh, that's what was referenced to in the phone call. And, uh, you know, if he can't investigate that and they try to change it around and they, and, and Nader yesterday, who's the uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee said that if they don't get him impeached, he may win election. That is a resounding deal. It's best if you don't like a person to get him out in the election box and that way you normally get rid of a person, uh, not to try to impeach because this will set a precedent that down the road, you, you could be a Democrat, independent or whatever, we're going to have more and more impeachment. It's going to it, it'll be basically an ungovernable uh, situation. Yeah, that's true. I've also read um, numerous different articles talking about how the whole impeachment um, situation that's going on right now, even though even if it may not work out, it does bring Trump really bad press and affect his. Um, his approval ratings, right? Which may yeah, have, you know yeah. what? His approval ratings have gone up six percent in the last week during the impeachment. Yes. Okay. The, the crazy part about this is, is it's kind of like the Kim Kardashian uh, effect. You know, yeah, I actually heard of that. It was crazy to see the more publicity that Trump was getting. People started researching more and actually saw what he has like completely. And people start feeling sorry. You know, I hate to say it, but he's not a the he he has reached. He, he goes out to these live um, rallies and stuff, and he reaches uh, people because, you know, talks about the economy, talks about this, talks about that. And more people, I think James Carville in 1994 said that unless the incumbent president will normally win as long as the economy is doing pretty well. So if people are going to vote their pocketbooks, they will uh, not, they'll do that instead of this other stuff. If they can understand that, you know, this this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, like it honestly just... legal standpoint, it is, I don't know. We've had three years of uh, constant things. Uh, we found out yesterday with the uh, um, Inspector General's report mm -hmm. that uh, they got two, uh, they had four FISA, FISA uh, warrants, all from a dossier that was put out by uh, MPS Fusion was paid for by the Democratic uh, National Committee to uh, get into Trump and, and uh, to find out information, all of which uh, allegedly should not have taken place. I mean, this is getting to a point where uh, it's very, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's 
beyond uh, the pale as far as, um, you know, uh, I don't know, it's undefensible, I'll put it this way. It goes to the very heart, like our FBI, you know, and different uh, organizations. But you have to, they're going to end up losing a lot of credibility, I think. But uh, when Emma was reading about this, we got from a professor, uh, and this guy's a political science professor, he says that he thinks that there'd be a groundswell of support amongst certain constituencies in the fall that would go out and get really mad and go out and vote. They may not have voted unless something like this happens. So uh, it looks like he'll probably be impeached and then go try trial in the Senate. And in the Senate, they have to have 67 votes. And the way they have the bills uh, laying out just the two articles of impeachment, not the eight like they had in the New York Times. Um, it's going to be very difficult because of the way the things are built. There have been 45 presidents in the United States. Mm -hmm. There could you could abuse con, abuse Congress. They could all be accused of abusing Congress. That that's a very uh, explain them. What Mr. Cunningham means is that whenever we what they are seeing as an abuse of power could easily be explained by just executive power, which is something that every president in the past has used. So if they create a precedent where. Ex uh, where executive power is abuse of power, then no president is ever going to be able to use executive power. Yeah, and yeah. executive power is the reason that we have like things like DACA and yeah. all these other things that are actually, I personally think are good, but you know, we disagree on some things. Um, you see, right now we're having a tremendous problem with uh, immigrants. And we're not allowing immigrants the uh, ability to get, uh, uh, unlike Canada that has a pathway to citizenship, uh, we have no real pathway to citizenship. So Barack Obama uh, decided to go around to Congress and he put executive order for DACA, which was uh, tried to get uh, people uh, uh, credible work cards, work permits. Okay. And it had jumped through a bunch of hoops. Well, uh, Emma and I both agree that we should help out immigrants. We just disagree on how we do it. We'll put it that way. Okay. And, the right way should probably be to give everybody citizenship. Because this other way, a fake citizenship doesn't really help out, is what I'm trying to say. And you can only do so much as an executive order can only do so much. The executive order can't change immigration laws. The executive order can give people work permits. And that's basically what you have, where we really, it's like a Band-Aid. We really need to have yeah. real help. Does that make sense to you? It does, yeah. and uh, I. I, I agree with with them, Mike. I really like DACA too. Like, I think it's yeah. Like from a Canadian perspective, I believe DACA is a great thing that Barack really put into the like really did for America while he was while he was in office. But um, unfortunately, we are short on time, and we do all have I'm to sorry. go. We hope that we can continue this conversation soon. Maybe after the whole impeachment process has gone on, maybe we can come back and really see what has went down, and we can discuss oh, maybe yeah. do a discussion on it. Yeah, rather than a debate. And we can really talk about all of our all of our views. Well, you can't really debate an impeachment after it's no, happened. No, I said discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.